My name is Oscar. I'm the venue owner. I thank you all for being here, and I hope that you are going to walk away from here feeling a sense of loving yourself more. Our panel speakers are incredible women who are just going to drop some knowledge on you. I'm really excited to present them to you today. So we have Nancy. She's on the show Love is Blind. So I know a lot of people are super excited to uh, be here for her and meet her. We also have Rachel. She's an incredible podcaster and content creator. And we're just very lucky that they were both uh, willing to come and speak to you guys. So we're going to be going through a list of questions. But before we do that, I want to let them have an opportunity to introduce themselves to you guys. So let's start off with Nancy. Hey, y'all. Thank you all so much for having me here. Honestly, I think um, after Love is Blind, I think having a platform to just share what my life is like, um, especially in real estate investing, I think that's really where my niche is. It's where my business has thrived. And so I am excited to talk about that. And then also... I think being love is blind, a big part of my life still, like I, uh, what I've learned from that and some takeaways, I'm just happy to be here. So thanks for having me. I'm Rachel, very excited to be here. Ray is a dear friend of mine and so many beautiful faces. Um, 30 years old from Carrollton, Texas, still live in Carrollton. Um, I work full time as a Salesforce consultant and then also have built a online community and health and wellness platform, I guess, centered around um, grief. I am a widow. My husband or my late husband passed away when we were 25 years old. And I'm a bone marrow transplant survivor. I've been through a lot, but always smiling, always having a positive outlook. And so I really enjoy sharing my life. And I'm always surprised when people decide to follow along. And so I started a podcast a few years ago and just have built a community and brand and I'm excited to share that with you guys. We'll start uh, with Nancy. The first question for you is in one word, how would you describe your relationship with yourself? I think a big part of the relationship that I've had with myself to describe it, I think it's growth because I I look back at just like five years ago, y'all, like 10 years ago, right? When I first moved to Dallas, where my headspace was then, I think that we're all trying in life to do better. And I think when you could really reflect on like, what was I doing February of last year? And where was I at two years ago, right? You can really see that even the small gains that you maybe don't recognize day to day, but when you look back at two years ago where you were, you know, be proud of yourself. Because I think for me, that's where I have defined myself when I was 25 versus where I'm at now. Even when I did Love is Blind, I was 31 and I, I was confident I was a happy person going into the experiment, but now I'm like happier <laughs> and I'm prouder and I'm more confident now. So uh, yeah, I think uh, my word would be growth. I would say intimate. I spend a lot of time with myself. If you know me in real life, I am such a homebody. I love self-care and rituals and routines. And I got to a point probably five or six years ago where I wanted my emotions and thoughts to stop surprising me. I didn't want to be anxious and not know why or feeling out of sorts or not feeling like myself and having no real reason as to why that's happening. And so I've spent a lot of time just with myself and journaling, reflecting reflecting, going to therapy. And so I always say that your deepest, most permanent, longest relationship you have is with yourself. And so you can run away as much as you want, but it'll always catch up with you, all of your emotions and feelings. And so I spend a lot of intentional time just intimacy and getting to know myself. Love that. I'm a big fan of the advice that I got a couple of years back that you should learn to be your own best friend. And uh, my mentor, he explained to me, like, how do you expect to be your own best friend when you don't spend enough time with yourself? You don't journal, you don't meditate. It's like you're afraid to be alone in a room with yourself. So I think that's like the first barrier of getting to that growth point and, and getting to know yourself is like spending that alone time, doing the deep work that's required to be your own best friend. So the next question on here is, how do you practice self-care when it comes to your mental health? I'm very into honoring my emotions and I feel like there is sometimes this sense of I have to always have it together or I can't be sad or something happens. You just kind of supposed to like move on from it. You're like, I don't know why I'm sad. I don't know why this is happening. And so I'd say one of my favorite forms of self-care as like silly as this sounds is just honoring all of my emotions and knowing that it's okay to not be okay. 
it's okay to have bad days and obviously I don't want to like wallow and stay there but I also don't want to dismiss it either because like I said it'll always catch up with you and so I think just honoring everything it's silly to think that we have such a wide range of emotions that you would only feel like positive and happy ones all the time and so when you're in the low seasons kind of recognizing it for what it is it's going to pass like that's something that's really great but I would say just honoring the seasons that I'm in honoring my emotions yeah I think for me self-care has really been something I worked on for a couple years I think it was so easy for me before to really again talking about growth like to be a people pleaser to make sure that you say yes to everything to make sure that sometimes that would mean that you're letting yourself down by being there for someone else or having people in your space and your energy that suck away from you and then you're left without. So I think for me, self-care now is truly learning how to say no. And it's even to like my best friend to be like, she wants to do something. I'm like, yeah, girl, no, (laughs) it's not, it's not happening. Like, and I think where I'm, I'm, I'm learning this no answer is that it's no, however, or no with my like terms, right? Like, no, I don't want to have dinner with you next week, but please like on, you know, on this month, on this week, like I would love to put you down for, you know, let's have dinner on Wednesday, right? So the answer no doesn't have to be so harsh coming from someone who is much so people pleaser and yes was so much easier and comfortable. I found a way to have a balance where I can say no if I still want to do it in some form or fashion because I, I want to see my best friend. I want to, you know, make sure I make time for her. I just make sure that it's under under my terms. And then that kind of has helped me to wean off of like the being a people pleaser and still being able to say no, but with a little some more boundaries set up. Love that answer. I do have a question for you, Nancy. Can you tell us about how you overcome self-doubt? You know, It's so interesting that fear is something that has really, especially since uh, Love is Blind came out, I had a lot of anxiety leading up to it the last few months. I've been in therapy for about two years now, but there was like this in the summertime, I just, I told my therapist, I was like, I don't know why I'm anxious. Like, I don't know why this is happening to me. Like, I'm scared, but like, I don't know why I'm scared. Like, really understand, like, what are these feelings? I'm crying, but I don't know why I'm crying, you know? And um, I think for me, fear was something that I had to recognize as an emotion and really try to figure out how do I accept this feeling and not stay there too long? Because I think that's the thing, right? Like not every day is going to be happy and even throughout the day. And there might be people in your space that, yeah, you're happy in one moment, but then, you know, you have to make adjustments to be able to keep your peace. So yeah, I think when it comes to self-doubt for me has been really understanding my fears and being able to make a plan in place, right? Like feel the feeling and then what happens next, right? So do I remove myself from that situation? Do I set myself up with resources? Do I call a friend or do I sit in like my room by myself with like the lights off and just like have a breathing moment, right? So yeah, I think I think for me, it's just really understanding where that fear is coming from and if it's something that I can manage. And if it's if it's something I'm struggling with, I do tell my therapist, I'm like, okay, I don't know what to do. Like uh, like texting her on the uh, online app that I use for therapy and I'm texting her, just reaching out for help. And that's something that I've never had in my life um, before starting therapy was not knowing why I'm scared or just wanting to like, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Like you'll be okay. Um, so really understanding that fear. And this follow-up question uh, kind of ties into that, right? Because if you have self-doubt, oftentimes it's because you're still needing to work on your confidence to believe in yourself and to know that you can overcome whatever is is headed your way. So what advice would you have for someone who uh, is trying to grow their self-confidence? I think for me, confidence is something that has always, it's been there in a sense that I've taken risks, whether it was taking a risk to go to college, being the first one in my family to leave the home and um, figure out how to get through school. I think for me, taking risks, as long as it's not detrimental to your life, you know, like um, like life altering um, risks. But I think in general, like just taking risks can really challenge your level of confidence. And it's like if, if you understand that fear is affecting your confidence or that doubt is affecting your confidence, take it by steps. It doesn't have to be all in one, like, okay, I'm gonna go run a marathon now. It's like, no, like, why don't I just start by like walking for 10 minutes a day, right? So taking it, I think, little by little and um, pushing yourself to do those risks and putting yourself in that kind of environment to be able to get to 
the level of, okay, well, now I'm walking 20 minutes a day when before I wasn't walking at all, right? So I think just taking it into little steps along the way and seeing um, the small growth turn into the big growth at the end, yeah. So this next question is, is for you, Rachel, and I am so excited to hear what you have to say about it because Anne and I, we have our morning ritual. We always read a book uh, regarding self-growth, and uh, right now we are reading a book called uh, Discipline is Destiny. And basically the entire book is showing us that having discipline in your life is a form of self-care, right? Because you promise yourself that you're going to love yourself more and by doing this or by doing that or by stopping this and by stopping that. But if you don't apply the discipline to make those things happen, then you're breaking a promise to yourself, right? It's like, hey, I'm going to eat better because I know it's going to be better for my health. And like, yay, it's January 1st. And then a week later, you're like, we're going to go right back to where we were. But in a sense, that's like, you know, you're breaking a promise to yourself. And so it's like, would you break a promise to your friend or to your significant other if that was something that you really, really wanted for them, right? So what are your thoughts about discipline and how do you stay disciplined to make sure that you are in a place that you want to be, whether it's in, you know, your courage, your self-doubt, your mental state? Talk to us about discipline. Yeah. To know me is to know that I live self-discipline. I think that it's a muscle that you have to grow over time. You made a really good point in something I always say that if you have this big picture goal of running, wanting to run a marathon, you have to put in the work to get there. But it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You don't have to just dive right in and go straight from running 26 miles. No, you start by walking and then jogging and then running and just being consistent, I think is the biggest thing when it comes to self-discipline. Um, one of my big philosophies is consistency over intensity. And so even if you only have 30% to give that day and you show up and give 30%, then you gave your all. That's 100%. And so I think of discipline as a muscle that you have to develop over time. And it doesn't just all happen at once. When you see people who get up every day at 530 and go to the gym or they read every morning before work or something, they didn't just like wake up and all of a sudden that was a habit. It's day by day, taking it one day at a time and saying, okay, today I'm going to make this healthy choice or today I'm going to do this and like keep showing up for yourself. I think those are the biggest forms of discipline for me and why I enjoy it. Absolutely. I've, there's another book too that I you reminded me of by you know, just saying today we're going to do this or I'm going to do this next uh, the next day. There's a book that we read called Atomic Habits. Yes. Yeah, it's love Atomic Habits. <laughs> it's so good. So uh, Atomic Habits, the very simple way to put it is you start with one habit, and then once you start getting the ball rolling, then you add another one. Like, oops, I'm brushing my teeth, and I'm also saying affirmations. Like, now that's another habit I added on, right? And now that I got those two habits, now the next thing I do when I do these two things is I'm, I go on a walk or I text my mom in the morning because I feel like I don't text her enough or whatever it is that you feel you want to build into a habit, you kind of use the habits that you already have and kind of just like glue them together. It's like, because I do this all the time, I want to start doing this as well. And it just kind of compiles over time. And by the time you know it, you're just doing all the things that you want to do. So the follow-up question to you, Rachel, it's great to have habits and we know that forming them is super important but a big part of that is also staying motivated we're all going to have days where we're not feeling so motivated right some days are low some days are high how do you stay motivated on your wellness journey i'll be honest some days you're just not motivated to do it i went to yoga yesterday and i did not want to go like i can't even explain how badly i did not want to be there i was in the parking lot i was like i'm not going in there but <laughs> But I, I, it's like, it's real. But I think that's where discipline is, like, that's where it's so crucial is you're wanting to still show up for yourself even when you're not feeling motivated. But I will say if I need motivation, I know, like, some people say that social media, like, comparison, it makes you feel like you're less than. But sometimes I follow such encouraging accounts. I'm very intentional with, like, the social media content that I consume. And so I am able to use that as a source of, motivation like oh this person's working out i'm gonna go get my workout into so what you're saying is you follow the right accounts to follow make the sure right accounts yeah, yeah yeah i do that a lot 
Like, I don't know, so, some people tell me, which is, there's no shame if like 99% of your TikTok feed is funny, but I like my funny TikToks, but like 90% of mine are like motivation or like, you know, how to grow your biz, just like the things that I know are gonna help me. And so I don't go on there and feel like, oh, this person has a better life than me uh, or anything like that that makes me feel low. For me, it's like, oh, this person's telling me how to have a better life for myself. And so I feel refreshed when I get to my TikTok account. So I don't feel as guilty when I spend hours. <laughs> you know, I'm like, no, this is cool. I'm like feeling great now. So Nancy, the next question is for you. How do you handle rejection? What do you do when you're continuously met with no's? When we think about rejection, I think in general, like it has such a negative connotation to it. Like, oh, you didn't get the job or oh, you didn't get the man. <laughs> you know, like that happens too. Um, but no, I think for me is that I truly have gotten to a point in my life where I have accepted that in rejection, it's a moment for growth. It's a moment to learn. And it truly is a moment for me to reassess. And I think it's, it's something that's so valuable in life, like being able to stop, take your feelings out of where you're at in that moment, assess the situation, and then make your choices accordingly. So instead of reacting to a rejection with emotion, like, oh my gosh, but it's a no, it should be, oh, okay, well, well, what happened? How can I analyze the situation? How can I take my emotions out of it and be like a third person looking in, right? So yeah, I think for me, it's, it's truly being um, able to analyze where I'm at and, and what actually happened. And I think at the end of the day, like I, I, I'm a big believer of everything happens for a reason. So if it's a no, it's because it was not for me and you just got to keep it moving. And I, and I think knowing that rejection is going to be helpful for me later, although you don't see it right there in the moment, but it's going to be for later that to me is very motivating. It's very inspiring because in that moment I feel sad maybe, but I know that there's something else that I'm supposed to learn from this. So reminding myself that it's a temporary emotion of maybe a temporary negative feeling of rejection, but that it is for the better of me and my future, and even though you might not see it in that moment. To piggyback off of what you're saying, um, we read a lot of books. Um, and one of the books that that reminded me of is hands down my favorite book that I've read. It, it took me personally out of a very deep depression and it's called The Obstacle is the Way. And uh, it's by the same author that wrote Discipline is Destiny. His name is Ryan Holiday. That's like, that's my preacher right there. Like I go to him when I need some help and I listen to his podcast all the time. Um, Obstacle is the Way uh, teaches you that all the no's and all of the obstacles that come your way, they are just an opportunity for you to prove to yourself that you can grow through it, right? And just like you were saying, like you have to get those obstacles to maybe get to a better place or like you don't know that there's a big lesson that you're supposed to, uh, you know, learn. And so you're supposed to see obstacles as like thankful that they are happening, right? Because with, with no obstacles, there is no growth, right? You're always gonna stay in the same place in your comfort level or in your comfort zone. And uh, for Anna and I, we we found it very difficult to lose four studios. This is our, what, sixth, sixth one, and losing uh, our four studios within a two-year period, having to restart a business six times, the financial investment, the emotional investment, it hurt a lot. And it was really tough to kind of like pull ourselves out of that. Uh, to even try this again, right? Because we do have a love of doing this. I mean, this is amazing to me that we were able to pull something like this off. And I had to read that book to see the nose of someone literally taking me out of business. If you guys don't know our story, a competitor signed a non-competition form with our previous landlord, wiped us out. We, we were legally not allowed to stay in the business that just like shot us to the top and we were like, on cloud nine, very difficult, but had that not happened, we would not be sitting here today. So the obstacle is the way, right? So if you lose something or you go through something, you have to decide that instead of letting it drag you down or give up, you must see the obstacle as the way. I must go through this to learn something on the other end. So with that, I think that the next question is a good segue into the question for you, Rachel. 
and you have a lot great advice that you're about to give us. I personally want to, before I uh, mention this uh, question, my little sister is back there. And I feel like this is something that I would love for her to hear from you, Rachel, because we, uh, we just went through a very difficult period in our life where we lost someone very close. And I know it was very difficult for my baby back there. So tell us about grief and how you go through something like that and any tips that you have for someone who's grieving the loss of someone that they love. Oh, well, my heart goes out to you guys. I always like death is just so hard. It's so permanent as like obvious as that sounds as you're still going through your life. It's just this kind of permanent emptiness. So my heart goes out to you guys. Um, so many lessons in grief. So really quick backstory. I got married in 2016 in Dallas. It was a brunch wedding. It was very fabulous. And um, less than a year later, like before we could even celebrate our one year anniversary, my husband was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And so that was March of 2017. And then a year and a half later, he had passed away. And so it was just one of those things where life comes at you so fast and you have to dig deep and tap into another part of yourself that you didn't know existed. And I do talk, I'm like gonna graze past that. But if you ever wanna go in deeper, I talk about a lot more on like Instagram and on my podcast. Um, but I had an interesting first year after Joe passed away. My husband's name's Joe. I dove head first into everything. I started a podcast, I started a business. I just like wanted to stay busy. And then probably a year later, I just was having constant panic attacks and I couldn't sleep. And I realized that I have been running away from my grief instead of allowing myself, like I said, to really sit with it and heal. And I think by understanding grief and again, getting to know myself, it's one of those things where we don't always get along, but she is my lifelong companion. And so we learn how to coexist and I take care of her and she tries her best to take care of me in hard seasons as well. And so I think when you're new on your grief journey, there's so many like resources and people like wanting to reach out or they send you podcasts and things like that when all you're really trying to do is just survive. And so be gentle with yourself when you're in that survival mode and do what you need to do to literally survive, to get through one day at a time, one step at a time. And then I think thinking bigger picture, grief and death, they are lifelong companions. You're always going to have that emptiness or that longing for that person. But I think when you think about the entire staircase, for example, it can feel really daunting. Like if I think about having to go my entire life without never speaking to Joe again, like that is very sad, obviously. But if I focus on, I just need to get through today. I just need to take this step forward. It makes it, I won't say easier, but it does make it more approachable. And so I think being gentle with yourself, doing what you need to do, surrounding yourself with people. And then the one thing I'll say is that I hear a lot of people like saying like, oh, my friends weren't there for me or you know, they weren't able to show up for me. And sometimes that's very true. Like I didn't have before this any friends who had ever lost a husband. So that was very new experience for us to be talking through and working through together. But I also had to get real and say what I needed from them and being vocal and not just thinking that people could read my mind. And so as you know that you're grieving or even just hard seasons, grief doesn't have to mean death. You can grieve a job. You can grieve pre-COVID you. You can, you can grieve a lot of things. And so I think just being, being real with yourself, being real with the people around you about what you need to be able to keep moving forward. I think when something like that happens when when a loved one is suddenly gone we did not know how to handle it you know no one that close had ever passed and when i got the call i had to pull over i was driving and i was like whoa there's just like an instant new reality of like everything was fine and then all it took was five ten second call i had to pull over and it just felt kind of like this different reality right after and you know we've done a lot of reading since then because i think for me um personally my journey through what happened 
was reading the resources or, or, or trying to figure out what it is that I need to understand about death and what other people have, you know, experienced as well, right? Because I think at, at a certain point in my life, I just kind of felt like those things don't happen to me because no, nothing like that had ever happened so close to home until it does. And so the journey after that has been filled with reflection and reading and learning a lot about uh, the topic of, you know, healing past it. Some days you just got to take it one day at a time and grow from where, you know, you were when you got the news and then just know that you're powerful enough to get to the next day and the next day and the next day. So thank you so much for your advice. I think you kind of did tap into this one already. Uh, you know, what advice would you give someone on their own grief journey? Are there any resources in particular, any books, any obviously your podcast, you know, listening in and, you know, what would you say to someone going through it? Um, any actionable items that you could think of? I actually just recorded an episode with uh, one of my friends who lost her mom when she was 19 years old. And we were just catching up and talking about grief and kind of some lessons that we've learned. And I think the biggest one is not feeling guilty about moving forward like with grief just because that person isn't able to or just because they're not here to be able to live out their life doesn't mean that yours has to stop too and that was one thing she had a moment right after she buried her mom where she was out at you know one of her friends birthday parties and was having a good time and I remember um, I think it was like the night of Joe's funeral I was like with my parents and we were just talking about like the first time that they met and things like that and like I was just laughing and I felt like just like I was with my people and I was like why am I laughing like I should not feel good right now but it's one of those things where it's okay to let all of your emotions in it's okay to feel happiness and sadness and grief and growth like you said and so I think knowing the difference between moving forward and moving on has been really good for me. I haven't moved on. I married the love of my life. I would do it 10 times over again, even like our hardest seasons and hospital visits. It's just, I obviously miss him and would live through all of that again. But at the same time, I have to take that grief and the hurt and the healing and position myself in a way that I can move forward with it. Right. The next question uh, that I have is for you, Nancy. So uh, talk to us about career journeys and taking care of yourself while uh, climbing to the top. I personally am super ambitious and I add a lot of things to my plate. I'm always trying to get to that next level and I feel like sometimes it's you get lost in the sauce and you're like not taking care of yourself or like, you know, you lose sight of being there for you while trying to achieve so many things. So talk to us about the climb and, and achieving all the great things that you have in mind. Yeah, I think when it comes to my career, so it's it's funny because I spent like, what, a hundred thousand dollars on getting my master's degree and and then included my undergrad degree to be a speech and language pathologist. And so I still carry that degree. I still am a practicing therapist, but when I bought my first property about 10 years ago, I'm sorry, not 10 years, seven years ago, about seven years ago, um, I just I just knew that there was more that I wanted to continue to learn and continue to grow. So then in my mind, I wasn't quite ready to say, okay, we're gonna put speech pathology to the side. We're gonna, you know, so I, I really did take it like one year, one goal at a time when it came to my business. And I think for me, like I really do analyze where I'm at with that particular, let's say one property before I, I acquire another one. Like I wanna be in a good mental space. I wanna be good in a financial space as well. Like. Can I afford this next purchase? If so, what does that look like? Um, where does the funding come from? So I think for me, when it comes down to real estate and building the multiple properties um, that I've acquired over the years, it's been truly being aware of what's working well, what didn't work well with that project, and how do I adjust for the next project? Um, I don't like to put a lot on my plate at the same time. Um, I'm very picky on what I'm going to work on. And I think that has really helped me to have 
more of a focus onto one particular area than having to do like 10, 20 different things at once. Again, practicing the no, <laughs> um, because I think for me, um, specifically with business, it's it's been a, a journey to get to a point now where I am very hands off and I have certain systems in place that can run the business without me being there. Um, but then if I want to tap back in, if I have a little time extra, then then I can go and readjust the plan. Like, well, what about, let's say this property, what can I do better for this property to maximize on that? When it comes to business, the beauty of it is that it really is flexible. It really can be. One of the ladies that uh, we were talking about her business and you know, the first year she started, the, the profits that came in the second year was better. And then the third year was even more better. So going, I think she said she's going into maybe her third year. And I think it's, it's that exactly like what is working well? How can I push it a little further? What do I need to adjust before I get into the next phase of my business? Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of how I've managed to be able to get to a point in real estate where I do feel confident, where I do see, you know, the five-year goal from here till the next phase and how that's going to be acquired as well. I need to tattoo no on my forehead because that's what I struggle with. Um, so Rachel, um, I'd love to ask you the, the same question, you know, when trying to do more for yourself, grow in your career, you know, build up your podcast and go after your goals. How do you take care of yourself? How do you put yourself first? One, one of the things that um, I've recently come across in terms of uh, advice, because I'm still working through that, is you should take care of yourself as much, if not more than you take care of your business. Because it's been way the opposite way for me. It's like my business takes like 95% of my mental state and then I come in very little and I'm trying to flip that script. So tell us about that. How, how do you take care of yourself while trying to climb to the top? I start every morning with myself. So it doesn't matter what I have going on that day. I work full time. I also have podcast content creation and things like that. And then I also have my own consulting clients that I work with. So on any given day, it can be from 6 a.m. until very late at night. And so I'm very disciplined with my bedtime. Um, so that way I know I can wake up the next day and still be able to operate at my best. So a lot of that comes from um, discipline and living with discipline and knowing what I need to do to be successful or to feel like I'm you know, making it through the day and putting my best foot forward. But I would also say that no matter how busy life is, no matter what's going on, your relationship with yourself is the most important. And so it doesn't matter if I have 30 minutes that day or if I only have five minutes, if I can just get in some deep breathing or meditation or whatever that looks like. I think that's how I start to put myself first. It's unrealistic to say that I will get 100% of my time all the time, especially if I have clients or workouts and other things that are going on. But if I can even just start my day by pouring into myself, then I will see dividends on that in the like days or weeks to come. And so again, it's not all or nothing, it's consistency over intensity. So even if you just have five minutes in the morning to spend your day with yourself and to start your day off on the right foot, that has helped me so much grow in my like full-time career. Your wellness journey, I think it always bleeds into work because everyone benefits, your job benefits, um, your salary benefits when you are operating at your best. And so I know what I need to be able to do that. And so it's almost like a non-negotiable. I feel that so much. Uh, something that's been really helping me personally is every morning, like you said, just just doing it and having the consistency and not the intensity. We always read at least one chapter of uh, a self-help book doesn't matter if it's 30 minutes or if it's just like it takes us five minutes to read a super short one. It doesn't matter the intensity. So long as we wake up and the first thing that we do is for ourselves, it sets the tone for the day. And I'm like, I got my win. No matter what comes at me, if I have a crazy day, I know that I did something for me and I'm able to like reflect on that. And it helps me overcome all the obstacles that are thrown my way. I want to add to that too. Like, I think it's amazing that the the word self blank, right? So like self love, self respect, like the primary word is self. So what works for you may not work for someone else. And so 
if it's you know we earlier we talked about the waking up at 5 a.m you know that's that is not for me like it is not let me tell you so so just remember like even in the self anything the self x right it's self first so like that primary word the root word is for you and recognizing that it's okay if you are a night owl and not an early bird or it's okay if you know if it's having a glass of wine you know a couple times a week if that's your self-care let it be that and and truly embracing and i think when you can understand what works for you and you're okay that it doesn't work for the closest people around you um it's good to have those that can relate but sometimes you are alone and you're like oh but none of my friends want to go to the hot tub and like soak for some time um but still do it anyways because it's for you and you want to do it love that so true so true i i see uh this guy that i love on uh tiktok and something that works for him that does not work for me is ice baths he's like this is how i work on my mental health and this helps me and all the the chemicals in your body and i'm like that's cool yeah yeah i'm like that's cool I'm going to read. <laughs> I'm going to read my book. <laughs> Let's go ahead and open up the floor to some questions. Again, you will be holding this cool little microphone so we can hear what you say. Does anyone have some questions for the speaker? All right, here you go. This is for both of you, basically. What do you do when you are having those moments of, like you're saying, you're wanting to tap into what your emotions are? Like, how do you do that, per se? That's a good question. I think, well... I've spent a lot of time in therapy. And so one of the, I guess, like tools that has helped me is writing down those emotions or like your triggers or whatever is causing you to feel what way you're feeling. And then having a very specific like action you can take. When I feel this, I'm going to do this. Like when I get super overwhelmed, I need to meditate, go for a walk. When you get super overwhelmed, you might go for, you might go shopping. Like, I don't know, but I think it's just kind of going at it with a plan as much as you can and just spending some time with yourself, understanding what's working, what's not working, and just being intentional. Because at the end of the day, if you're feeling a certain way and you even pour into yourself just a little bit, like it's it could be trial and error. Maybe that worked th this day and it didn't work the next day, but I think it's at least just like trying to meet yourself where you're at. There was something that I actually did years ago and it's funny because I started doing it again and I forgot that I did it before. But um, it was uh, it, on my phone, I have a notes section that is just for like thoughts and feelings. So like if I get really pissed off from a friend who did something that I'm like, oh my gosh, like I'm feeling a certain way, instead of reacting and doing something there and then, I write it all down. I, I write everything that was, you know, almost like a letter to myself. Like these are the feelings, this is what's going on. And then if I still feel that feeling, later that day or the next day or after I go do something more productive to get my mind off of it. If I still feel it, then I can act on it. And then I can say, well, what do I do next? Do I talk to this person about it? Um, especially in heartbreak, um, what I've done is exactly that. Like I've written letters to my exes um, on my phone. And if anyone ever gets access to those, oh, it's gonna be the tea. So, and, and it was crazy because, um, again, this is why I, I recently started writing stuff on my phone again, and it was due to like X purposes. Um, and I went back and I reread some letters that I had from other situations that I was just like, wow, like I was in such a dark place at that time. And I got out of it, you know, and like, oh, wow, like I'm processing this letter. One letter got me emotional, but it was like a happy letter. It wasn't even like a sad letter. So, so I think there's something very powerful of like having the thoughts and putting them down in some form or fashion. If you like writing songs, write a song, you know, if it's just writing the, the thoughts down, if it's turning to, you know, social media to, to get some kind of encouragement, um, but just finding a way to like, um, I guess just put it, put it out there. Talk to someone if, if therapy, I'm therapy as well. So like, yeah. Very cool. Does anyone else have another question? It can just be a topic like, hey, do you want to? talk about how to grow on social media or right or Riley. So I think, you know, I'd, I would love some insight on that. I, Cause one of the things that I know that has helped us is, you know, just being real, right? Not seeing people as like, here's my next marketing tactic and 50% off this. And I feel like people don't really resonate with that because it just feels like a billboard, right? And I think what both of you do very well on your platforms is being your most true authentic self 
And that resonates with people, right? That's showing up as you. And I think that's what draws people in because people, you know, in terms of like growing followers and being entrepreneurs, me, myself, I know Carla uh, too, and Lindsay are photographers. You know, we, we want to reach more people and grow our business. Um, and I've learned that people don't like doing business with businesses. They like doing business with people. Um, so yeah, I guess Rachel, tell us a little bit about growing online. Any tips that you have? I feel like growing on social media now is honestly so hard. Like there's just so much content that's always being produced. The average life cycle of a tweet is 18 minutes. So in order to like really be seen, you have to be tweeting like every 20 minutes. Like that's how aggressive content is being produced. And so not to sound discouraging, but <laughs> it's like, it's, it's hard to grow on social media. And I feel like I really started to grow my platform at a time when it wasn't, you have to post three reels a day. You have to post every day you have to do polls and have your stories be engaging. It was, you could just show up as yourself and then people were attracted to that. And so I do think that there's still an element of that. And I really focus on nurturing my audience that I currently have. And as more people come into the fold, that's great. But like transparently, I've stopped focusing a lot on growth and more just how can I be a better content creator? And I think by default, you grow because you're putting your best foot forward. But I try and not make that be my entire focus. A lot of people will say it's like consistent reels and putting content out there. And that's very true. It's just not something I like have capacity for. I can't, I can't make three reels every day. I just, I can't. <laughs> and so, yeah, I focus on things that I enjoy too. Like I like growing my podcast audience. I like um, putting out episodes more than I like creating like short form reels. And so it's also doing the things that you enjoy because that doesn't feel like work to me. Whereas if I was editing a lot of TikToks or having to create graphics on Canva or whatever, I'd be like, I'm out, I'm not doing that. And you know what's funny? Like in my experience too, like you said, like the posting that so many times a day, if there's something I wanna post and I'm like, oh, but I already posted twice today. But if I really like that piece of content, like, I don't know, let's say it was a, I don't know, something that I just was like, oh my God, that's so good, I wanna post it. I post it anyways. And I think like, if it feels good to you there and then, like sometimes I post something, I'm like, oh, it's, like, I don't know how it, it's going to do or like the strategy behind it, but I'm like, I, I want to post it because it feels good to post it. And then it usually ends up doing so well, um, whether it's engagement or likes or shares and, um, and it surprises me, but it's, it's again, that organic, that authentic, the, what feels good to you. And it can be that you're posting about coming to yoga for a whole week, you know, um, or, uh, or it could be something else, you know? Um, so I think just if it feels good to you, if it makes you laugh and it makes you feel good, post it. Um, I have a tool <clears throat> that has helped me so much with posting lately. And it's the secret sauce. If y'all don't know about it, y'all gonna go home and sign up. I bet you. Has anybody heard of chat GPT? Does anybody use it? So it's artificial intelligence and basically you chat or you just write to it like if it was a real person. And so you can say what I personally do is I tell it who I want it to be. And I'm like, you are a master marketer. You're going to help me make 50 reels today. And you're, you're going to script out every single thing that I'm going to say. You're going to tell me what shots I'm going to get. And then I hit enter and there's like the entire content plan. It's insane. It's crazy. Yeah. R right before I went up to speak. I didn't use it because I, I just like was like, I'm just going to wing it. But I got nervous. I was like, oh, wow. I didn't know I was going to come and be the presenter today. Right. But I went up to ChatGPT. I was like, help. I'm about to speak in front of people. This is what's going on. I need a way to introduce the two speakers. The event is about self-love. Tell me what to say. Boom. And then it gave me a whole script. Any one last question or I think we did pretty good today. I think the last thing to do is just uh, tell us where to follow you, where we can get more information about what you're about. And yeah, let's start with you, Rachel. I am on Instagram, Rachel Simone Gilliam, um, full name. My podcast is Rosé with Ray. It's on Apple and Spotify or really anywhere you listen to podcasts. And then if you like little nuggets of wisdom, I have a daily text service where you can text Daily Ray, D-A-I-L-Y, 
RAE, it's one word, to um, the number 22999. So my Instagram and my TikTok, TikTok is more like for fun stuff, but um, I, I'm trying to do better about being as funny as I like to be on TikTok on Instagram. Um, it's the same, the Nancy Rodriguez. And then I do have a YouTube channel, Nancy Rodriguez Life. Well, thank you all so much for speaking to us. You dropped some knowledge. I'm feeling inspired. Thank you all for coming. It's been amazing. I don't know. I love me more. I'm just saying. I, I It worked. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much.